Mariella, mm. you've been uh, you've been indulging in this sort of hundred years from now perspective for yeah. for some time now. Do you feel uh, optimistic about the future? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, after listening to Guy, I get nervous. But no, but yes, I think there's like uh, I think there's potential anywhere like you know it's but i think it's a very i think it is a very uh particular time that we're in now but i think definitely i mean we also kind of started off at this idea of not making a dystopian uh, point of perspective which i think for me has been really healthy um because the narratives that are circulating is often very negative when it's for a reason but i think also in like a zone of the imaginary or like the artistic, we can also allow ourselves to not be in reality. And I think that's really the potential that fiction has. Um, but fiction also feeds into reality. So fiction can really be an influence on us. So if that answers your question, <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. That's a good answer. Uh, gentleman with a turtleneck. <laughs> What's your name and, and what do you yeah, do? My name is Kelly. I'm from a public organization called the Sphere Lab. Uh, my question is, is that uh, does we miss something in this discussion of the future of facts that you've been talking about? And I think that can we discuss uh, or think about how the democratic system should look like in the future? Because I think that all we talked about now is actually a reaction to the system we're living today. And I think that all the troubles that you, know, at least Guy told about is how we try to react on the the, the democratic system that is probably which some kind of dead end street where we just have to maximize the votes for the next four years. And that is the main problem. What are your thoughts about how to redesign the democratic system? I, I promise you, if you look at my notes, this was the last line. <laughs> but I thought I'd better shut up because I talked long and long enough. I, I think our democratic system is in just as much crisis as our income distribution system. We have electoral democracy dominated by the plutocrats, by finance, etc., and where they manipulate us. I think we have to go back to that ancient Greek set of distinctions, where for the ancient Greeks, shole meant public participation in the political process as well as education. And I think that means we have to resurrect deliberative democracy. Deliberative democracy whereby more and more of our political decisions comes from discourses that are organized so that everybody can be better informed. At the moment, we have social media and IT and the Elon Musks and the Zuckerbergs m manipulating our imagery, the very th points that you were making. And I think that we need, that is absolutely fundamental, we need a totally revived deliberative democracy. I happen to live in, in Switzerland, where we, where I, in my village, for example, we have referenda all the time. And you go into the local auberge, cafe, or whatever, and you'll constantly be talking to someone about, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about? And this process where you go back to the village, in inverted commas, is something that goes with our commoning orientation, our artistic regeneration, that is actually bubbling to the surface. That, that there's a lot of energy in these various initiatives. We should not be defeated by the fact that things are black at the moment because that sort of thing is bubbling and it has to. I hope that answers. <laughs> yeah, I have a question to you, Jan. Uh, Mikael Rydholm, uh, independent consultant. Uh, thank you for sharing your super interesting thoughts. Uh, I have a question around um, societies uh, governed by women. Mm. If you have studied any real today existing societies and how they work. Yeah, um, I am actually uh, working with that right now. Like I have uh, loads of books on my desk. There are matriarchal societies. Uh, 
in like all over the world, uh, they're very small. In Europe, we don't have any left at all. Um, but they are functioning a little bit back to, to democracy as well. Uh, a lot of matriarchal societies are built on consensus rather than democratic systems. And, and also, um, I think we're, we, if we talk about democracy, we need to talk about the scale. A little bit what you said about social media and everything. But we need smaller scales mm. of, mm -hmm. of working together. And I think matriarchal societies uh, are showing that. That's, that's how they're, they're constructed and built. Um, yeah, Can you give examples of where, where are they? Um, Africa uh, and Asia have uh, the most of uh, what, what I know. I'm, not, I'm really not an expert in, uh, in this, but I can recommend um, uh, Abenroth that I mentioned. Uh, she's been working on matriarchal societies only for like 40 years. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, she's a great person to, to read. Yeah. Hi, <coughs> my name is Paula from Moral Heights. Um, I wanted to get your opinion in general on the emotional piece regarding these kind of changes. I've done a lot of work lately with young sustainability leaders where we bring into the surface the challenges that we're facing. And I realized that the moment that those problems are highlighted to us in a way that it engages an emotional reaction, there is a freezing moment where we completely stop. And this for me, I think it's very important to work with because on the face, in the face of these huge challenges, <coughs> how do we create systems of support where we can lead a conversation forward that comes from love and not from fear? Because that's where I see a lot of the issues is we get lost in this, there's the fear, there's the anger, and there's the incapacity of us to transform that to be able to move into the imaginary futures, the co-creation. So how do you think we can work with this piece? Because it's not something that we're educated in. We're educated in thinking logically. We're educated in creating systems and abstract images. We're not educated in feeling the greed mm. and the pain of the world and being able to move through it. Mm. I think that goes back to this uh, thing with the existentialism <laughs> and like really, um, I mean, as an artist, I can say, like, I think that art is, in a way, both uh, religious and a type of fundamentalism. It's a belief system of some sort. And I really think that um, what a lot of art is trying to do is, like, accomplish what the things you're mentioning, like provoking an emotion or provoking a reaction. And I think there's, but there's also a tendency within the art world and within culture to stay in this intellectual sphere and like not really um, get under the skin <laughs> of people, but to kind of keep it rational, keep it intellectual, stay in the theory. But I think what's also so important is like to do this hands-on kind of thing and to really provoke emotion. And th that also goes back into the community of actually being in contact with each other in different ways. Um, but I don't have a solution. I mean, I think it's a cultural thing, and I think this crisis that we're living in is a cultural thing too. Like it's it's a distance and it's a rationality that's becoming harmful in many ways. But I, I'm jumping in here. Yeah, yeah, cool. It's spot on what I'm working with, <laughs> actually, because because I think that's uh, like w the core issue that we're seeing right now. Because we we're we're quite shallow. Uh, as uh, human beings at the moment, uh, and then we have all of these crises, and then we're trying to solve them with shallow solutions as well. Like as I mentioned, technology, for example, rather than actually going, why, why, why is this happening? And when, and the fear, like why am I feeling this fear? I mean, how often do you hear a politician or someone talking that way? Um, I th I, yeah, I think that's uh, definitely something we need to kind of unlock and and be brave enough to to. Uh, to talk about and the solution I have <laughs> I have a few but but just to kind of um, uh, a wild one uh, uh, philosophical consultancy for billionaires mm. I mean you know uh, exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> and then like uh, not giving them any option to kind of back out of that like like uh, that's a must no in counseling. case you have a, a, a income above a certain level you board, need to yeah, go and see I this therapist mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I'm going to answer your question slightly differently in the sense that while I agree with what's just been said, 
I think we have to go back to the economics of the system that exists today, okay? It, it is a fool's errand to say that the future of a good society is going to be higher wages and jobs. We have to dethrone jobs. Every politician likes to boast that their policy is going to create more jobs than their next politician, right? We ought to mock that because we should be saying, well, I would like to hear how would you reduce the number of jobs? That's what I want to hear you say because we don't, jobs are a fetish. They're a fetish. They are the enemy of work. They're the enemy of care. They're the enemy of commoning, etc. Enemy of leisure. So therefore, why are you putting them on a pedestal? Okay. The second point about it is that it's a fool who thinks that our real wages, whether it be in Sweden or any other part of Europe, are going to rise significantly in the, in the near future. Globalization and technology are realities. And real wages will continue to stagnate and fall and become more uncertain. And we are living in an age of uncertainty. And for an economist, uncertainty is where you're living with unknown unknowns. We cannot predict when the next shock is going to hit us. We've already had six pandemics this century. We've had financial crisis after financial crisis. And more and more of us are actually vulnerable. We lack robustness in the sense that any of us could be hit. And we lack resilience, the capacity to recover from being hit by a shock. Millions of people know that. And that sense of uncertainty means we have to think differently about protection, differently about the way we work and the way we support each other. And we have to say to the Social Democrats, which, who have been the, the progressive wing for the past century, your old agenda may have been good back in the 1960s or 70s, but today it's irrelevant. It's not part of the solution. Because we have to convince enough politicians and political people that a new agenda must come. Because otherwise we'll be floundering around, whereas the plutocrats are taking all the gains. So I think it is partly economic and partly political, whereas many of us would like to focus on commoning, work, etc., etc. But it is at that macro level that's important. One last question in the back. Yeah, hi, uh, Maria, uh, working for the Agency for Accessible Media. I was just a follow-up question there, Guy. H how is that going? Like, are the politicians listening? Are they taking this in? Because it seems like this discussion <coughs> was very lacking in the election in Sweden. That was not long ago. H are you seeing any progress? <laughs> not just with the social democrats, yeah, I, but I'm, all I'm, over the I'm going to answer that. The politics is you. The politics is me, right? We are politics, okay? If you look at what's been happening in elect election after election, the far right have not actually been gaining a majority. It's us who've allowed them to get into power because we haven't mobilized and strategized about overcoming their dominance. And that's why I think going back to the first, your first points about images and vocabulary and the way of, of postulating this challenge is so vital, so important for it. I belong to an international Euro pan-European group called DiEM25. And we are trying to push that envelope of progressive thinking. I'm mildly encouraged three days a week not seven days a week, by the fact that we, at the moment we have a hundred or more basic income pilots taking place around the world. If you had said that to me five years ago, ten years ago, I would have said, dream, dream. And all of them so far have been fantastically positive in what they've shown. Fantastically. So that the now, in opinion polls, we're getting majority support for having a basic income. And more and more young politicians in particular, and young trade unionists and so on, and feminists in particular, are suddenly having the courage to come out in favour. 
Whereas for many years, a senior politicians would say, Guy, I, I actually agree with you, but I don't know how to come out. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was basically it. But I think now we're getting to a stage where the most reactionary people are the Social Democrats. They are holding us back. But there is this opening because more and more people realize we're at a dead end. And I think that's a, a, it's a transformational moment. We do have a threat. It's a Polanian moment. The threat of the annihilation of civilization is there. But at that moment, many more people will see light, I believe. And that's where we have to, you know, the Gramsci metaphor about the pessimism of the intellect, but the optimism of the will. I think we can do it. But it's up to us. Isn't that right? Wow. <laughs> Guy standing, Jenny Gettve, Mariella Utterson. Thank you.